my pleasure tonight to reintroduce uh, Michael Young. Michael was here in 2017, in June, uh, if I remember correctly, that was for Hong uh, Kong uh, that year. And um, Michael, I'll just give you his um, very short bio and say a few words. Um, he, he studied architecture. Um, at California Polytechnic University, and after which he basically did his postgraduate master at Princeton. And immediately upon finishing that uh, study, he uh, came in and assisted Peter Eisenman and also Stan Allen. And uh, after which, again, he had a academic career that took him as a visiting assistant professor to well both at Princeton and to Yale. He's been teaching at a number of other schools, including SIA, Columbia, and he's today, um, he's today assistant professor at Cooper Union in New York. Um, in 2007, if I remember correctly, uh, he founded Young and Ayata in New York, and the work is as um, stunning and intriguing as it is also profound in how it basically draws on disciplinary concerns in architecture. Uh, he's a prolific writer. Um, I recommend you to visit Young Nayata's um, homepage and on the menu you will find then the choice writings. Um, obviously the work, the written work has also been published in uh, numerous journals and books. Um, the work has been exhibited in, um, likewise, in numerous uh, galleries and um, ranges basically from objects via installations to, to architecture. Um, having Michael here is also a privilege. We have spent the day with him now and, um, and enjoying his machine gun um, rapid but also precise delivery of the discourse where he helps us to speculate basically on the status of the image in architectural culture, in architectural production. And quite a few people do that these days. And uh, sometimes also with a, almost a nihilistic abandon of what uh, history, might, um, how history might inform such an interest. And this is where I think Michael is one of those who sets up a difference his um, interest in the discipline and historical knowledge is as erudite and profound as it is uh, provoking. And he helps us to basically understand um, this image as it is today in relationship to uh, modes of drawing and how basically that has been transformed or transited through history. So. Um, it is exciting to have you back, Michael, and it's a, a great help. I have a little, small little treat. Um, Michael almost didn't become an architect. He was, namely, playing in a band, and um, they traveled. <laughs> There's always um, something just in incredibly humbling about listening to yourself 20 years ago, and uh, thank you for that. Uh, it, it's it's nice to at least start in start in a mode of um, uh, not not embarrassment. I'm not embarrassed about what I did or the band. I thought it was great, but it was also 20 years ago, and so those things those things happen. Uh, 
Thank you, Johan, for inviting me back. It's absolutely wonderful to be here. And, and thank you to Sylvia and Yara. Uh, we're going to have a fun three days in the workshop. And uh, I love this place. I've only been here one time before, but I've been just completely impressed with what you are doing here and the kind of, uh, how, sh how can I say this without sounding too corny? Um, many architecture schools are becoming ever more and more homogenized into the larger university structures and relationships to professionalism that uh, we deal with as a profession. What I cared about more, not that architecture is not a profession, of course it is, is the discipline of architecture. And the discipline of architecture includes the profession, but it also includes our history, and also includes spaces of exploration, and those spaces of exploration are rare. The university, the uh, academy, the architecture school is one of the few places where you have that luxury and that privilege, and you're doing it. Suck it up, spit it out, Take it to where you possibly can during your period of time here, and it will propel you into a future that you cannot totally predict. And it's always amazing to see schools that are able to do that. Uh, so I'm saying all this while we've got these, this set of words behind us. Fear of the mediated image. Uh, it actually kind of ties into this preamble in a little bit of a way. I said this probably a year and a half ago, I'll say it again, some of you may have been here, uh, most of you probably weren't, but this statement that I have about at least how I understand one of our roles as architects. One of our roles as architects is we are responsible for the aesthetics of the background of reality. Uh, this is crucial. Aesthetics are all the ways in which the world becomes sensible to us, the ways in which it is made sensible, not only to humans, but the relationships between things often initially are aesthetic. It is not the sprinkles that you put on top if you have an extra, uh, extra little bit of money for uh, your project. It is a fundamental way of engagement in relationships in the world. Uh, the background of reality relates to an observation that Walter Benjamin made in his work of art in the age of its technological reproducibility, which is that architecture is the art form that is consumed in a state of distraction by the masses. First time I heard that pissed me off. I didn't want to be going to school studying something that was uh, consumed in the background in a state of distraction. I wanted to be doing the stuff that was in the foreground, the stuff that people paid attention to. But if you think about it slightly differently, that aesthetics of the background constitutes what we assume the real to look like, to perform like, to be like. And if you can come in and you can disturb that, if you can challenge it, change it to be other than we assume it to be, you actually open up an incredible space for uh, possibilities of people imagining themselves to be other than they assume themselves to be. It's an incredibly uh, strange and liberating moment to find that uh, those things that we assume to be the real can be other. Now, as far as this word, the real, I'm not here uh, claiming I have new access to reality and I'm going to now tell you about it. I don't. Uh, we all have access to whatever reality that is that we uh, exist in. What I mean something is, is closer to the aesthetics of realism. Realism is never a copy. It's not verisimilitude. It is not an identical uh, visualization of the world. Realism is the aesthetic movement which produces doubt which challenges, which estranges the ways in which reality can look. And it's been so since uh, paintings from Gustave Courbet and writings uh, from Flaubert in Amal Zola uh, in the 19th century, all the way up until today. And I'll show a few examples of that. But now we get to this fear thing. Because our world has been for many years, and ever more and more so, uh, mediated through images. It is part of our reality. And for us to d diminish it or to uh, avoid it or to ignore it is to ignore a substantial part of the ways in which we establish both our understanding of the world and our own identity. And, it, and I'm talking about, you know, not only uh, these, these things that we carry around in our pockets that go under the name of telephone, which of course they're not telephones. We don't, I mean, how often do we use these things to call anything? Uh, they're basically devices that access images that mediate the world. These things, these computers, they are the space of our labor. This is where we work. 
they're also the space of entertainment. They're also the space that brings us the, the uh, thing we formerly called news. Now we call whatever we want to call it. It has various names and, and all of them are uh, conditioned to the problem of what is the news or what is the truth or what is reality. And architecture is part and parcel of that. We cannot ignore it anymore, even though we may be afraid of it, and even though it may produce anxiety. So the argument that I'm going to lay out tonight, and I'm going to lay it out in, in a few forms. One is to try to establish when and in which ways are we actually fearful. Is this something new, or is this something that has been going on for many, many years? Uh, what are the responses that we as architects are positioning? today. Uh, what are some alternatives to that? What is a history that extends us back into the architectural image? And then a few projects at the end uh, from my own firm, Young and Ayata, that are uh, tuned to address these things in another manner, even in their shortcomings. Also, I'll say this too, I'm not showing any of the work that I showed last time I was here. It was recent enough that I didn't want to repeat myself too much. So I'm only showing three projects that come from the last year. So the, the most current stuff. Okay. Fair enough. All right, are we afraid yet? Nobody remembers the Public Enemy album anyway. Uh, uh, two images. And, and I don't think we should be afraid of them. I mean, here, it's, it's, our, it's our, our friendly, cuddly uh, heroes of modernism, uh, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright and Mies van der Rohe, although I don't know how cuddly uh, they may be. Um, and there are two images that we know very well. One is from the Wasmuth portfolio, the drawings, illustrations, and renderings of Marion Mahoney, the, the hand in the eye and the sensibility responsible for the entity we call Frank Lloyd Wright. If it wasn't for what she did and was able to do throughout her career, we would not know Frank Lloyd Wright in the way that we know him. And we have Mies van der Rohe's Seagram building, a building that exists in New York. It's a real building. If you run at it really fast, it's going to hurt your head if you crash into it. But also an image, and that image is from Ezra Stoller. And what I'm starting here with, with these two images, one, a perspective, a projection, a speculation about what a real building will look like, one, a photograph, a document about what the objective reality of that building does look like, actually start already to pose a couple questions for us to consider. Um, one, they both use abstraction to uh, present their images. No one will ever see that Frank Lloyd Wright building that way. No one has ever seen that Mies van der Rohe building that way. This is an eye that is floating somewhere in the sky. The verticals remain vertical, required as a Stoller to have a large format camera. Uh, it is clipped and edited to present an argument about the Seagram building and an idea about the Seagram building in terms of its monolithic, uh, almost, uh, obelisk-like shape of radical new architecture in relationship to the old architecture of New York. This image does as much as the real building to uh, extend a kind of argument about international modernism in its uh, corporate, uh, I won't say generic, but its, its way of kind of clearing out the specificities of a local condition and a modernity through a radical abstraction. And in terms of Frank Lloyd Wright's Wasmuth portfolio, this is the first publication of his work in existence. It's 20 years into his career. He didn't publish anything for 20 years. His first publication is not in America. His first publication is in Europe. It is in Germany. And the images in it become a huge factor in spurring on discussions of an emerging modernism within the European architectural community. So the problem here is that these images do as much, if not maybe more, than the buildings themselves. They are a reality. They establish a reality. They establish a discourse. They extend ideas out from a specific locale, a specific place, a specific time, and spread them through the world. And they are not made by architects. In fact, most of us actually consider rendering or imaging something that we do not do. It is something that we send out, that others do, that it is busy labor, that it is labor that's actually hidden. Because most of the times when that image is shown and that image is shown, we do not see the names of Mary Mahoney and Ezra Stoller. We see the names of Frank Lloyd Wright and Mies van der Rohe. 
Now, I'm not claiming that images are more important than buildings. What I'd actually like to say is that they exist uh, in an ontological leveling. They are as important, they are as real as the buildings themselves. And in fact, when they're working at their best is when they produce a tension between reality and its representation. Now maybe we're getting a little more afraid. All right, because what are we gonna do now? This is an incredible rendering by Mir, uh, the Norwegian rendering company. It looks as real as can be. But it is actually aestheticized in, in many manners. It's cropped, it's framed, it has a certain melancholia of the uh, lone wanderer of the uh, tundra of Switzerland and, and this kind of building that exists in there. But the problems we begin to have as architects is this is a combination of the two images we were just looking at. It's a speculative perspectival rendering. It does not exist yet. But it's speaking all the aesthetic codes of photography to us. It's saying, I exist. I am here. This is a document of reality. And then we start to get a little creeped out. Because what are we supposed to do? There's nothing in this to allow us to produce a doubt. There's not uh, that level of abstraction. There's not that level of uh, construction. There's not that revealing of the artifice. And we have to treat it as if it's a real building. Now, is that a problem or not? To treat the rendering as if it's the real building? That's an open question. But if we're afraid a little bit now, we get very afraid when we see these. So this is a Google image search from a few days ago on uh, the title Architecture Renderings. And this is what you get. This is the reality that Google will spit back at you uh, when you go and search for architecture renderings. And if you are afraid, be very afraid because the Google image search for just architecture looks almost the same. So architecture and architecture renderings are collapsing and compressing into a space that is, for many people, the ways in which they not only will first, but maybe only engage in the development of new architectural ideas. Uh, it's still, uh, travel is still hard and, and reality is still uh, contained in that manner, but it does come to then build new understandings of what is the world in which we live in and which we operate in. So what do we do with this? If this is the condition, if this is part of our reality, if this is part of the way in which we need to work as architects. It should be said that these two things are very different spaces of dissemination. The Wasmuth portfolio is literally a portfolio. Uh, the Stoller photographs are for architectural record, a journal, a magazine. The Wasmuth portfolio would be exactly akin to the kinds of portfolios pervaded through the Beaux-Arts as part of their pedagogical system. It is a series of drawings and plates. It's almost the same as Latour Lee's Edifices of Rome, Ancient and Modern, the same format, the same structures. The architectural content is a little different, but it is something to be used by an expert audience, to be traced over, to be studied, to be pulled out of the portfolio, put down on a table, a vellum on top, and studied by architects. The space of architectural record is completely different. Photography transforms these things, as uh, Corbusier and Osenfant knew. They are now putting images in juxtaposition with each other. Images of the world extracted, images of the world then put in new spaces in combinations with, new, with other images and in combinations with text. So the text here for this architectural record issue on the Seagram building was written by Arthur Drexler, who was the head curator of the Museum of Modern Art. So it gets more and more institutionally constructed. But these spaces of the journals, these spaces where images can be above, below, next to drawings, next to uh, each other, create a kind of uh, space of contrast, juxtaposition, and discourse on the image itself. The Wasmuth portfolio only had a few thousand copies printed. They're now incredibly rare and incredibly expensive if you like to get your hands on them. Uh, Architectural Record printed a few hundred thousand. They were distributed all across the world and they mostly ended up in trash cans or, or the archives of uh, architecture schools. This is very different. This is the space in which we are dealing with now. 
Uh, where's the institution? It's self-promotion. What is the purveyance of an aesthetic idea? It is uh, accumulated and disseminated in real time to hundreds of thousands, if not uh, potentially more, across the world. It is done uh, by the architects themselves. It is promotional. It includes things about how cool they are and what they're doing and how many cool people they know. Like, it's great to know that Jimenez uh, knows or met Rune Coolhouse. That's fantastic. Uh, but uh, this is not to be looked lightly on, because is this producing a space of discourse? And if so, what is that space? What do we do with the blogs and the websites and the uh, social media that is constantly bombarding us? Where you, you realize you have seen more images than any generation prior to yours. The people who will be younger than you will see more images than you. This is an ever accelerating, ever increasing situation that we are living in. And most of these images, I, I have Instagram, I use it, I'll see something maybe in between a couple microseconds and then maybe 10 seconds. What? Tops? And then another one comes. And what the hell does that next one come, coming up on the next uh, feed have to do with the one that came before? Sometimes it's curated by the things I like and the things I dislike. Other times it's curated by algorithms that do not care uh, about you being a human or not being a human. Now that's not necessarily positive or negative. It just means that the ways in which these images are related to each other is not curated by things that have eyeballs. It's curated by data reading and data collection. It's curated by the ways in which things become disseminated, and it's curated often through similarities that we can't even be aware of as human beings, that are outside of our consciousness of putting things together. Which is why maybe a response like Andrew Kovacs's Archive of Affinities is so fascinating to me. Uh, that he started this, by the way, for all of you who are in your master's degree. He started this when he was a master's student at uh, Princeton. And he just basically started collecting every single architectural image he possibly could and organizing it through very easy categories of affinity. Sometimes it was all the circle bu buildings in plan. Sometimes it was uh, images that had the same color spectrum. Sometimes it was uh, simply density of, of uh, information. And he now has this thing that you can go to online that has hundreds of thousands of images that he's scanned over the last, uh, what is almost nine years now, and all of them associated into random juxtapositions. Again, almost a kind of logic that is outside of the curatorial logic we would assume to be important, but beginning to make combinations of what he calls architectural B-sides. I don't know if any, if you, any of you remember, but when he released a single, yeah, and it was on vinyl. You had an A side and a B side. And the A side was the side that the record label thought was going to be a hit, and the B side was something else. Uh, but the B sides actually are often more interesting and become more, more strange and important than the A side. So for Andrew, this is his uh, version of collecting the B sides. Another thing for us to think about here. Do an image search for Malevich's white on white. You will get anything but white on white. You will get white on kind of white, white on kind of pink, on white on kind of peach, on kind of pastel blue. Uh, you will get all of these different variations and versions of what the internet understands your query to be about. Uh, some of them aren't even the painting you're looking for. Uh, it's pretty good that most of them are Malevich, though. Now. We can condemn this and we can say the aura of the original of white on white is lost and all we have is this kind of massive confusing dissemination of, of these images. That would be an extension of Walter Benjamin's argument about what photography does to art objects. It pulls them out of their context and place and time, spreads them as identical copies around the world, and no longer do they have the aura. They are now images, and they are uh, consumed in another state. Not about the originality, but in the copy. A lot of people have used that to uh, apply it to the internet and say it's just the same, only now faster and more. More loss of aura, more loss of originality, more loss, more copy, faster, faster, faster. Boris Groys, though, uh, has a counter argument or an adjustment to that. Because what he says is that when you are looking at images online or in your screen in any digital manner, you are not looking actually at images, You're, you are looking at the performance of data. 
because the image is stored as data. It's stored as a set of instructions. And every single device will have different color settings, different resolutions. Every single piece of software that opens those images will interpret that data in slightly different manners. So that in a way, every time you open an image file, it is a one-off. It's a singular performance. It's all aura with no original. Because where's the original in this set of images above us? I don't know if I can tell you which one it is, and in fact, it doesn't matter. It is all aura, it is all performance. The reason these things look different is because you have modified them. You are now implicated, you are now participant, even if you just used your phone to take a picture of it, or different color settings to modify it, or whatever it is that you may happen to be capturing this through. These are now spread and modified by people and then put back out into the world. I don't know if you've had this experience yet, but it's a really interesting one. I've, I've seen now images of, of my own architectural projects totally different than the way I made them. They go out into the world, they get modified somehow, often accidentally, sometimes randomly, sometimes they're clipped, sometimes they're cropped, sometimes they're squeezed, sometimes they're stretched, sometimes the colors are messed around with, and then they come back as the real images. And we have to think about what we do within that space of dissemination, which is our image world online. Uh, I happen to actually like this image quite a bit. I, I find something beautiful about all the different color variations that happen to be randomly accumulated around this painting. And whether or not any of them is the original is not even a question that I care to ask because it is becoming and creating its own sense of reality. Back to this. So, as architects, what do we do with this? What, what are our possible responses? Here's one set of responses by a group of eight architects. There could be many others that I could include in this. These, these are not, uh, for one reason or another, the best, or the, the, there's many others that we could put up here. These are architects, though, that have taken on full well. Architecture is in an image culture. Architecture is disseminating on the internet. Architecture needs to address this, but it cannot do it in this manner. So they've shifted, and what have they shifted? Well, they're arguing against the photorealism. These are things that are abstract. They're arguing against the kind of uh, high end of digital technologies. These are often low end, low res, uh, simpler. They're making arguments that the architectural image can move back more towards the abstractions of drawings. And they're using them often to construct narratives. Now we could say it's also the result of uh, living in a world where we, we now work in a color spectrum that's an exchange between subtractive and additive colors, uh, RGB to CMYK. We could say that we all just play Monument Valley too much and the uh, pink gradient washes in axonometric space has become naturalized into uh, our aesthetic realm. Or maybe everybody is just into kind of micro constituencies of aesthetic subgroups like Vaporwave and Sea Punk and, and there's a collaging of uh, uh, inappropriate things against each other with a little bit of uh, irony and a little bit of uh, dolphin and a little bit of uh, pink and magenta. To, or maybe everybody's into the low res pixelization of frontality and the kind of medium specific expansion of what it means to work at the low resolution of the pixel. Or maybe they just like David Hockney, who, who doesn't, David Hockney's a pretty good painter. Uh, and definitely within all of them, there's the creeping of OMA and uh, Mr. Cool House. Now, I'm being a little bit flippant and I'm being a little bit, uh, uh, you can almost say kind of uh, snarky about this. Uh, a lot of these architects are my friends and I, and I like them a lot and I think they're quite good architects. Uh, but what I'd like to say is that even though we can pull out these things and analyze their responses, a much more serious disciplinary agenda is what I said right before I showed these. They are architects who are moving into images that are countering against realism, employing pop as an appropriation, working at lowering resolution, and dealing with the collage. What I'd like to offer is that their response is one potential direction, but not the only direction. So four categories from there that I think can actually be thought through in a very different manner than the way in which those eight architects have positioned it. First is realism versus abstraction, then photography in this thing about the truth, uh, appropriation in collage in the question of the scene. 
And then what is it to work at multiple resolutions? Okay, first of them. Realism and abstraction are not against each other. From the first moments we have an aesthetic movement called realism uh, within the 19th century with a painting like The Burial at Arnons from Gustave Courbet, we get with it abstraction and realism simultaneously. Or in the better way to say that, I know that, sounds, that was a very confusing statement, let me rephrase it. Realism actually uses abstraction to estrange the real. <coughs> That's a painting. You know it's a painting uh, of a bunch of people, uh, and they're at a burial. Okay, got it. Uh, but what's also going on here is the everyday quotidian reality of life, a peasant burial in the provinces, is given the status of the grand narratives. This is a, a painting that's 12 feet long, of usually reserved for Ovid's Metamorphosis or Napoleon doing something or a story from the Bible, uh, now given to peasant burials, which means it is now on the public, it cannot be in the private, it is now a space of public display. And the things that are being displayed are not being displayed in what one could call a natural manner. And we could do, we can spend an hour on the burial or non, uh, but just a few things to point out. The entire thing is flat and compressed like a bas relief. There's not a lot of space in front, there's not a lot of space behind. These people are squished together as if you took them and compressed them into one little shallow space. There's uh, huge swaths of black, which if you see the real one, is almost like looking at abstract expressionism. All the brush strokes are left there and it's just black mass that's kind of spread across. There's a very strange compositional thing going on with a kind of accordion zigzag thing that's happening. And then there's all these twins, twin girls over here, twin handkerchiefs over here, twin buddies with their little suits. These guys look like they might be good friends, twin pallbearers, twin choir boys, and then a single conjoined headed twin of the priests that is in the middle. And I don't know about you, that's weird, right? It's a pretty abstract thing to do. Nobody's looking at each other at all. They're all looking in different places except for this cat who's looking at you. Uh, and, and as far as I know, the only place that happens is on like a New York City subway. And, and so whatever's going on here, this is not a verisimilitude copy of the real. It is strange. The same stuff is going on with Jeff Wall's uh, Morning Cleaning Mies van der Rohe Foundation Barcelona. That's a photograph of what was formerly known as the Barcelona Pavilion, but now is the Mies van der Rohe Foundation Barcelona because it's a reconstruction that was built at the end of the 80s. And it actually is a, it's a person cleaning the windows in the morning. So he's telling us what it is, kind of just the facts, Jack. But there's some very strange things going on in this photograph. First of all, the entirety of the image is in focus, which you know anything that has a lens cannot do that, from eyeballs to cameras. There will always be some depth of field, there will always be some blur. The entire thing is in focus, uh, except for you start to look at it, and this figure in the back appears out of focus to this figure in the front. But the way that is actually constructed is by using ever more precise details on increasing soap suds on the window. So the cleaning is what is producing depth of field, not the photography. This thing, this column in the, in the, in the middle and the front is in exactly the same focus as the leaves in the back. All right. The other thing that's a problem here is the morning, because the quality of light inside is radically different than the quality of light outside. By starting to pick out these subtle things, you begin to realize that this is a collage of multiple, multiple photographs taken over three days. And it's collage to construct a reality that you accept as being a real photograph of, again, the mundane, everyday, ordinary stuff that goes on, cleaning a window. Uh, but it estranges that. It makes you question, makes you doubt, makes you think differently about that reality through the abstraction of collage, removing its seams and putting the pressure on the medium of light and focus, which is the medium of photography, and putting those two things as uh, the issues which are under an abstraction. Even more to the point, I used this example last time I was here, but it's, it's just so... Uh, it's so precise that I, I, I like to use it again. There's nothing more abstract than Malevich's black square. I mean, this is the desert of the senses. There's nothing there. It is, it is just a black square on a, in a canvas. You're looking at what? Yeah, abstraction. Okay. But let's think about it differently because this may be the first painting in the history of uh, Western art that you do not look through. 
that you look at. Because there's nothing to look through to. When you go and see this, what you notice is the cracking of the paint, the pigment. You notice the, the fraying of the edges. It becomes a thing that, that wears and ages and, and patinas and gets destroyed, just like every other thing, like uh, uh, you know, any, any kind of object in your house that you're going to have to replace. It becomes a kind of realism, a thing you look at, an object in the world, as much as in simultaneously in tension with the abstraction of what it is attempting to kill in representation. A contemporary example of this, this is a series from the Dutch artist Harman Brenthauer. He's only done two things over the last 30 years, squares and cones. We'll see the cones later. This series was a series of uh, marble fragments hung in a gallery. And you can look at them and you go in and say, wow, the gallery decided to show a bunch of stone. That's very nice. I could see that in a showroom. I'm an architect after all, and I can go find these things. But you look closer and closer at them, and you realize this is not stone, this is painting. What Brenthauer did is he hired some of the best fake stone painters in the world and gave them a meter square, square and told them, go for it. Paint whatever you desire. You are the master of that uh, Brescia Vailet. You're the master of Campan. Paint me that. Paint me what you believe that to be. And if you are actually a master of doing these kind of fake uh, marble stone, it's not like you sit there on a wall in a building and have the photograph uh, and kind of go back and forth. You're so good at it that you can improvise a wall of stone that is that species. So what these actually become closer to is they become almost a form of abstract expressionism they can be interpreted to have as much personal psychological content as abstract expressionism. Except for they're not abstract, they're just fake stone. Which is why the title of the exhibition is kind of amazing, False Abstracts. These are fake abstracts, they're not real abstracts, they're fake abstracts, which is completely strange to think about. So this is from a few days ago uh, at the Charlottenburg exhibition in Copenhagen. And it's uh, Alicia Quade, and this is an art piece that she has in shaky handheld cam video. And so I don't know if you just caught what's going on there. We'll play it one more time. Do I need to go back and come into it? All right, so there's a mirror, yeah? And there's two rocks on either side of the mirror. So there's a real rock, looking pretty real. There's its mirror reflection. Uh-oh, what's that? Oh no. There's another real rock, but it's exactly the same as the other real rock. Which one is the real rock? <laughs> But this is kind of to this point. It's using abstraction, reflections, mirrors, doubling, twinning. And one of them obviously has been completely silvered. I don't know this for sure. I can suspect uh, that this one would be the real rock. And then there's an identical cast of it that was made and then painted silver. But I actually don't know. You know, this could be fake and painted to look like a real rock, and that could be the real rock over there, then just covered in silver paint. You don't know. And in fact, it's the tension between those that makes it work so well. Um, the tension between reality and its representation is realism. All right, photography and truth. Uh, photography has a problem in that it's usually understood to collapse these two modes of, of knowing the world the iconic and the indexical. The iconic meaning it looks like we think the world looks like. The indexical is light passing through a lens, uh, stimulating chemical reactions on the emulsion of a film strip that then gets developed through uh, the photographic uh, process. No hands, no intervention, no uh, abuse. Just light, lenses, chemicals. 
indexing the reality of the world. So the icon and the index overlap and appear to be of the same. And thus, we trust them. That's a photographic truth. This is part of mechanical objectivity in the 19th century that changed our understanding of the sciences. But what I'd like to say is that actually is, is a false conflation. It's never really been that way. All photography manipulates the world around it, and, and we know this, and it's just good to hear it again. So, Brendan Hilla Becker, uh, in, the incredible German photographers in Dusseldorf, these are documents of a reality that was fading in, in uh, the kind of years of the 60s and 70s, and they're documenting them. But there's an incredible amount of abstraction that they're bringing to these images. Uh, the lack of shadows or directionality of sunlight, the evenness of grain and fidelity of detail, the removal of sky or the unification of sky, the removal of the context around the buildings. It allows each of them to be almost like an abstract architectural elevation that's claiming to give us the facts and nothing but the facts, but in their serial arrangement, in, in their distancing, in their flattening, we begin to read them in in a very different way. Uh, no longer, let's say, the truth, but the doubt about the truth. They trained some of the most important photographers of the last 30 years, Thomas Struth, Thomas Ruff, Candida Hoffer, uh, Andres Gursky, Jorge Sasse. I show this photograph because the very first time I saw it was in June of 2017 in the building across uh, the courtyard from us right now, when there was an exhibition, and it blew my mind. Uh, this is a collage. It's a collage of five different photographs. The grass, the wall, the blue columns, the red barn, and the uh, turning Ferris wheel or amusement park ride in the back. And in fact, Sase added the blur. So this is not a real world. This is a fictive world. This is a collaged world. This is not a world that is giving you access to the truth, but it is a world that is creating a, a doubt about that truth. And it uses this tension between abstraction and realism again to produce this effect. Even more so something like this. This is a project by Jean Font Couberta, and it, he was studying the released archives after the fall of the Soviet Union and, and looking into the missing information of the Soyuz 2 mission, which was a space mission in the 1960s, and he realized that the astronaut had been erased from history. And so he found the original archival documents and, and was able to kind of uh, bring out this, this sort of artifact of a certain era and a certain time <coughs> in relationship to this mission. Now, he has hundreds of photographs, he finds uniforms, he has all these different paraphernalia and sets up this exhibition. Then you start looking at it a little closer. Every single image of the missing uh, astronaut, Ivan Chernikov, is a self-portrait of uh, Jean-Franc Coberta. He has dragged himself into every single one of these images, which means that this is the fake image and this is the real image, okay? Now, if this is the real image, there's no way I cannot, after seeing this image, look here and wonder who got whacked. I just cannot look at it. I, there is something wrong here. There is something missing here. I am now thinking very differently about what is the photographic document, the photographic object, and actually beginning to understand that the question of truth is not necessarily one where this is, this is real news, this is fake news. The question of truth is something that we begin to construct once we have access to be, in, be able to uh, critically and aesthetically engage the images around us. If we do not have that doubt, if we do not have that fingernail hold into those relationships, then everything kind of blows over us and we don't know yet what we're looking at. And this is obviously a big problem, a big question within today's world of image mediation. Uh, and so something like Van Coberta and his art, his kind of parafictional investigations, crack at that, they hit at that. They use aesthetics to make us raise questions about ethics and epistemology. Appropriation in the collage scene. This pulls from that as well. Uh, collage, one of the major challenges to art within the 20th century. Here is, is Hannah Hawks, cut with a kitchen knife, an early Dada's collage, in which fragments of the world as imaged are pulled, removed from their context and put into new relationships with new context. And in that juxtaposition, we begin to, to uh, create new narratives, new scenarios, new understandings. Um, 
they are no longer the things they were, they now become something else. We know this as collage, it's one of the, it's one of the crucial things that it does, a kind of appropriation, a decontextualization, and a recontextualization. Now, part and parcel of that is also what you do with the seam. By the seam, I mean the exposure of the fragmentation of the image itself as an artificial construction. When and where and in what ways do you expose that seam? Uh, in architectural representation, we've engaged collage throughout the 20th century, and I'll show just a couple examples here. And we've done it in, in a few manners. This one is again David Hockney, um, but also Mies van der Rohe. And it is done for us, for those who have the knowledge of it being David Hockney and Mies van der Rohe. It's like the appropriation sampling of a band like Girl Talk, which n requires you to know Ozzy Osbourne and the Beatles simultaneously. So when they're put together and then layered into Jay-Z, you understand what is coming from that confusion, right? You need to know the reference. Yeah. It's appropriation within that manner. If you don't know Mies van der Rohe and you don't know David Hockney, this has a very different meaning to you. Yeah? Collage, decontextualization, decontextualization, recontextualization. To me, my favorite thing on it is that the uh, vanishing point produces a mirror symmetry in both the images. So that the pool gets mirrored along this line and the landscape outside gets mirrored along that line, which is very strange. Um, the other way we use it is to be very clear about what is not real and expose that seam critically. It, it tells us we are utopian critical architects. And that either can be the architecture goes super abstract or it can be the background goes super abstract. Architects do it either way. Um, but you've seen this numerous, numerous times. And these are two examples, Johnson Markley and Super Studio. One, the reality of the context, the architecture abstracted out from it. The other one, the reality of the content, the background abstracted from it. But we understand in that exposure of the seam that we can clearly tell this is not real. We can clearly tell, we now can speculate on its utopian possibilities or its formal possibilities or its other kinds of uh, questions. But the confusion is erased with the exposure of the seam. This does not make them bad collages, I think they're incredible collages, but that is where the seam operates in that appropriation. Not so here. So Philippe Scheer, the architectural imaging um, master of Herzog Demeron for many, many years, who went out on his own more than a decade ago, uh, builds these images. They are Bill Balton. And in building these images that look like photographs, but are not photographs, they are collages. They are collages in which the seams have been removed. Or maybe more precisely, the seams have been displaced. They are no longer at the edges of two fragments of cut out pieces of paper cut with a kitchen knife. They are now feathered into each other in the space of a digital um, construction. But to point out the reveal, let's just look at a couple things. Here, this weathering pattern is exactly the same as this weathering pattern. And I don't know about you, but that doesn't happen. <laughs> nah. Right? It just doesn't happen. Uh, I also don't know about a foreground that looks like this in backgrounds that look like that. The reflections seem to be of a totally different world. I mean, what, there's like cafes here and, and stuff and then just like everybody's sitting around having a nice time in front of this object? Or even more so, here's the kind of stamp on the whatever rusted steel. But it's just this thing stretched. It just doubled it. This thing too is just stretched. It's just copied, paste, sheer. Uh, you know how to do that. Uh, so all the telltale signs of the abstraction and the artificiality of the collage are there if you look for them. And the overall effect that she, uh, Philip Scheer is trying to produce is one of a kind of strange reality, an estrangement of the real. And he does so. They have this thing that kind of flutters and hovers between uh, is that a real thing, is that not a real thing, and it's done through the erasure or the displacement of, this, of the collaged seam. Multiple resolutions. Uh, so one of the things that, that many artists and architects have been doing is working at a low res. Um, the digital always is low res. There's no such thing as high res. 
if we keep shoving our face closer and closer to a computer screen eventually, right, we see the pixels. The only thing we call high res are the things that escape the, the resolution of our eyeballs. As long as our resolution of our eyeballs can't see the resolution of the screens, we call it high res. As soon as we can see the pixels, we call it low res. But what this actually means is that r resolution is variable and multiple and happening at many different scales. For instance, here's Thomas Ruff's JPEG series, this one of an iceberg, in which he, he appropriates found images on the internet, JPEGs, and then blows them up, this one to 174 by 324 centimeters. So big that the resolutions of the pixels begin to become almost like abstract color field studies in and of themselves. This image, though, that we're looking at is a very high resolution copy of that that I got because I'm writing an article on it. Yeah? Here's the one you're going to get. This is 14 megabytes. This is 44 kilobytes. Yeah? And you may think, oh my god, there's no difference. Maybe the color is a little different. Yeah? All right. Let's zoom in. All right. We just zoomed in. So this is the high resolution version of the Thomas Ruff photograph. And you realize that actually there's some insane labor going on here because it's not just big pixels, it's actually compositions of small pixels inside of big pixels that were actually smaller pixels, meaning there's multiple resolutions going on at the same time that he's working with to get things like a gray blur, striations, pixelated movements that are moving in this direction. I mean, if you think about all the different combinations that are going on here, it's kind of amazing uh, the, the work that's present in that image. Um, here's the low res version. Yeah. Now the low res version is low res because it can be disseminated quickly and easily on the internet. It's a poor image, but an image that is available and accessible to us. The high res image is an image for art consumption to be hung in a gallery or accessed once he gives you rights to reproduce it. This is something that's kind of interesting. We are working in a world that is primarily low res due to the economy of distribution and access. There's a dollar sign attached to it. There's uh, a need and an ease to exchange low res images. This is why most of the ripped movies that you're seeing pirated onto YouTube that you're watching at your desk are at a lower resolution so that they can actually stream through your services. Most of our reality is at a low res when it's processing and moving through these digital environments. One last example with this. Uh, this is Rue Klein's Apophenia and uh, it is a satellite image of the planet. More and more so, we're assuming satellite images of the planet are giving us a real version of the world. But we all know that the satellite images on Google Earth are images from multiple satellites taken at multiple resolutions at multiple times, and we may love, I know I love, running that scroll bar and zooming in on the planet, and like, here we go. Right? It's amazing. Um, but then you, you watch it happen, and then you see those juxtapositions of like, where all of a sudden the resolution shifts, it's got uh, rough pixels, and then it gets finer, and then it gets finer, and then it gets finer, and you wait for, up, for it to update, and then the moment where it's all of a sudden uh, winter and summer along the line, and they had been taken at different times. It's the most artificial collage construction you can possibly imagine. It is not real. It is, it is a construct. So what David Rue and, and Carol Klein have, have done with this series of images is create new satellite photography but of a very strange sort. You've been looking at this for a little bit now, and it's a pretty weird one. I don't know exactly where this would be on the, on the planet. <clears throat> what it is, is it's a convolutional neural network that is combining two images. The Himalayas, yeah, you can see the kind of uh, you know, snow and peak patterning of the Himalayas. In downtown Los Angeles, with Dodger Stadium. Yeah, there's Dodger Stadium. So there's the highway interchange of the 101 and the 110. Highway 101, Highway 110. Going to Pasadena, going to Hollywood. Here's the shift in the grid of the city. You can see that register. Um, so it's a collage, but it's creating a new reel. It's creating a new uh, understanding, but one that we doubt, one that we know that has some problems with it, one that we know that is strange, one that is putting pressures on how we understand that world. Okay. So uh, uh, I hope everybody is still with me. I've taken a little bit longer than, I've, than I thought I would because I'm just having fun. Uh, 
and, and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to jump through the middle part of the essay, which everybody in the workshop uh, already saw. It's totally cool. And uh, go to this. Um, I think it'll be m m more sensible due to the time and due to where our minds are. And maybe it'll, it'll also get us into some other discussions. So I'm going to, th I'm going to show three projects from my, my practice, Young and Ayata. Uh, and again, they all happened over the last year. And, and so they're, they're kind of tied up in, in, in this. So the first one is an apartment building in Mexico City that is under construction. And, and I'm showing this partly because it's our first job that's being built and we're kind of happy about that. Um, and if you want to have some questions about reality, you know, nothing like getting, getting things built that uh, puts that under pressure. So here's the, the rendering of it. Um, the nine unit apartment building is five stories. And uh, the reality of the site constraints were such that typically the zoning allows for four stories, but you build to the plot line, okay? Now what that means is you only have windows on the front and back. We made the argument that if you pulled in from the sight lines, you could get a variance for a fifth floor. The argument was liked by the client and passed by the zoning board, which we'll come back to in a second, which means that you would now have space on the sides to also have windows to have apertures. But of course you're thinking, well then what happens when your buddies build buildings right next to it and they build up to the plot line and you got a window that's looking at like one meter and another blank wall because they're not going to be able to put windows on their wall and there's going to be people looking at blank walls. So the argument came, what if all the windows rotated in pulled into the building, meaning that all the views out would be oblique. So that you'd be in the interior and your eyes would be split and be able to look down out into the site. This also maximized the volume within that new envelope and allowed us to do this kind of funny experimentation with uh, ruled surface cast concrete, which uh, the building was going to be concrete. It was Mexico City, they're masters of concrete construction. We knew it was a project for a developer. We were not going to be able to rearrange the floor plan inside too much. And yet this kind of got us into this funny condition of the estrangement of the aperture. Every building has windows, one of the most normal things we can possibly have. What happens if we start to screw with the aperture and only the aperture? And what we started to find was that it also started to, to do something very strange to the aesthetics of the exterior tectonic, where the board forms going vertical uh, met the board forms going horizontal at the slab, but the horizontal slab was now being sucked into the building as it pulled into these windows. And we'll see what this means. So here it is under construction. Uh, it's now up to four stories. The government changed. We lost our variance. We're not going to get the fifth story. Or maybe we will if we find the right uh, friend. Um, and you can start to see how those ruled surfaces are starting to push and pull at the windows. And so something that's a very flat, very uh, monolithic, very solid building begins to become activated and, and dynamic as these windows push and pull in and out of the building, uh, creating kind of a, quite a strange effect as you look up and see the kind of the facade start to vibrate above. It also does this weird thing that we were interested in. It comes initially from Smithson's in antiomorphic chambers, which if you don't know are two mirrors and two chambers. And as you walk closer and closer, they start to reflect each other and you start to suck your eyeballs this way until eventually you have to go one way or the other and then you look infinitely in either direction. Um, these windows start to do some strange things. One of them that we didn't quite predict is because of uh, their tapering and chamfering, they sometimes make the roof and floor look sloped. The roof and floor are not sloped. The roof and floor are flat. It's the window that's sloped. But depending on where you stand in relationship to the window, if you stand exactly at the 45, the window perspectively flattens out and everything else around you gets weird. Yeah? Uh, they also open up these moments of I'm inside looking outside, looking inside, looking outside. And that's pretty good. Um, kind of happy about that one. All with a flat facade, uh, which, was, which was a very kind of funny um, result that, that we didn't, you know, it's always interesting. You can draw and draw and draw and represent and represent and represent, and then you build it, and all of a sudden reality puts tension on the representations you made and does things you didn't predict and uh, becomes strange in ways that you didn't predict. 
And now just, these are photographs from uh, a few days ago. It's finally getting its glass and it's now, with its glass, all of a sudden, the roughness and the rawness of that concrete takes on a completely different aspect aesthetically. Before, it almost looks like a ruin. At least it looks like a ruin to me, or a building that no people will ever inhabit. Uh, but uh, <laughs> introducing the glass all of a sudden makes this kind of clear, clean break between the rawness of the concrete and the sort of precision and abstraction of the glass plane that puts the two into a, a, a new charged tension. Okay, uh, three sonic huts for a cone. So this is a project for our friend Harman Brenthauer. And you already saw the squares that were the false abstracts of, of dealing with marble. What he's been doing is he's working his way through all of the different uh, aesthetic and decorative arts that have been produced by humanity over the history of time. He just never changes the shape of the cone. He never changes the shape of the square. So it's a conceptual art project on craft, which usually are things you don't imagine going together, but they're going together in, in kind of a wild way. So here's some of his cones, and just to give you a little bit of an idea of what he's working on. Uh, so this one is done in this silver filigree that's only done now in one village in, in Portugal. This one is uh, 3D printed out of eggshells, so it's cannibalistic, an egg being made from an egg. Uh, this one is about uh, two and a half meters tall and done in a, in a, in a Roman mosaic pattern. This one is taking ancient Chinese uh, flower petals and then genetically modifying them with scientists to produce new kinds of flowers and then uh, ornamenting them within the same tradition. This one is the uh, called dragons dropping. There's a specific dragon in China that's that's a combination of a camel and a lizard and a snake and a bird and a crane and this and that. He collected the shit from those nine animals and stacked it into this and called it dragons droppings because actually, yeah, that would do it. Um, this one is the one that uh, Kutan and I, Young and Ayata, did for Harman Brenthauer where it's an exquisite corpse uh, interest in Owen Jones' Grammar of Ornament, which was the 1856 book that Owen Jones published of all the known ornament at that time, all published in the same graphic manner. And so we're going to do four more of these, and it's going to basically exhaust Owen Jones' Grammar of Ornament within a series of five cones, all with a kind of a random juxtaposition of, of ornamentation when we did this. We had four interns in the office. We gave each of them a chunk of the cone and told them not to talk to each other for two weeks. And they had to develop an ornament that would fit within that spot. And then we gave them material attributes like cardboard, gold, uh, strawberry, and jellyfish, I think were the four uh, material attributes they had to work with. And they developed this thing. And then we 3D printed it out of powder. It's, it's about yay big. And, and oh, anyways, we like it. Um, but some of Brent Thauer's cones are actually musical instruments that you bang them and their bells, they produce a sonic vibration. So Harmon asked us if we would be interested in creating pavilions, thus the sonic huts. And we proposed three different designs for these sonic huts. Uh, the first one is this one. Each of them comes with their own uh, relationship to context and to materiality. The exterior, and by the way, of course, they're squares. Uh, the exterior is a reference to the false abstracts, where these are digitally created patterns that we're using multiple different stone and wood grains to fuse a single uh, construction of graining that would look at one point very real, but then once you looked at it a little bit longer, incredibly abstract and artificial. Uh, these would clad all four sides in the top and be book matched along every single corner, but it's the moment you move away from the book match, you start to get strange variations and strange differences in local symmetries that make you question what you're looking at. All of them would float, all of them would hover, meaning all of them would be on a kind of base. Uh, this one has this sort of uh, amplifier so that as you stood inside of it and walked around the cone, or walked around the bell and banged it, it would bowl out and all of the sound would become intensified around uh, uh, the exterior of that movement. This one, slightly different. 
Again, similar ideas about the, the texture on the outside, the abstraction and the realism and the floating, but now elevated up high enough that it looks like it could crawl and come and get you. And, and so it brings with it another context, a context of a kind of mobility, as if this is, is uh, slightly nomadic, slightly animate uh, construction that would move through the landscape. And it sonically is a series of separate chambers that you move into. So the first one is a collector, the second one is, is a, a, a fragmenter, meaning that the sound would just be total noise until you moved away from the cone, did not look at the cone, and moved into the sonic space of each of these little niches. This one purposefully trying to disconnect the space of vision in the space of uh, the aesthetics of the sonics. And then this, this last one, disengage the space of uh, sound completely from the space of the bell. So you would actually need two people to do this. One person to hit the bell, and then another person which was standing in these chambers on the sides, and thus a complete disconnection between the sound and uh, the act of striking. Now, you may be thinking, all right, so what the hell has this got to do with this stuff? But um, what it made me think about was I was just in probably one of, one of the most uh, exciting virtual reality experiences I've ever had about an hour and 15 minutes ago uh, across the way. And, and what was interesting about that is something that we we're trying to get at here. Uh, the mapping of the room, and I'm sorry I forget the name of the student uh, who did this. You guys can help me. Sono? Did I just say that right? Sounds like Sunan. Right. Um, what we're experimenting with this in these three different options is this tension between reality and its representation. And that virtual reality, mo uh, that virtual reality room has a slight difference between when you physically touch something and when you think you're going to touch it because it's mapping itself right back on itself. And that tension produces a really uncanny feeling. It produces an estrangement of the realism. So what each of these is trying to do is in one way or another take the cone as a formal generator, take the aesthetic project of Harman Brenthauer as the, the concept for the project, but begin to pull apart the idea that what you see and what you hear is the same thing. So that depending on where you stand, depending on where you look, and depending on where you are, you begin to hear and see radically different worlds. Now I'm not sure which one is going to be the most successful, the most provocative, the most interesting, they haven't been built yet, uh, but it's all in where does that tension lie. If it's automatic, if you look at the bell and you hit the bell, you know what you're doing, you're hitting reality. If you hit it and it doesn't happen for like a couple days, you know you're smoking something of a very specific variety. But uh, if you can put enough pressure so that what you hear and what you see becomes estranged or in put in tension with each other, then we're trying to uh, activate this sonically now as an aesthetics of realism. And the, the last project that I'm going to share is a competition that we were, uh, we got to the second round in 2017 and then we didn't win. Um, we had this experience with the Bauhaus project I showed last time I was here, which is, it's lots of fun. Uh, anyways, so it's a concert hall in, in Kaunas, Lithuania. So this is a building that's on a river, that's on one side an industrial uh, concrete plant, and on the other side of the river, historic UNESCO preserved uh, downtown. So we decided that we wanted to have a building where the front and the back had nothing to do with each other. And where the front looked like the back and the back looked like the front. And it was going to look like two buildings and it was going to be one building. And it was going to be heavily material and it was going to be abstract uh, to the nth degree. So here's the back facade, which is really the front because you see it first. And it's got shingles along the bottom and a kind of rusticated concrete along the top. And here's the front, which is really the back, which is a abstract slice through two buildings to create one building, and in that moment of abstraction, compress it into an image, make you doubt the reality that you're looking at. Uh, we'll kind of go into it a little bit more. So here are the two main buildings of the theater. This is how the site is being reorganized. You enter between the two underneath them, 
uh, in what becomes a gateway or an arch. The rest of the build, the rest of the site, by the way, was conceived of as a series of foundations for future projects that would all kiss each other in the same way. So our part of our argument was, well, you know, you're going to want to have some more buildings in the future. What if we organize the entire site as foundations in which this building would kind of replicate and continually kiss each other until it was, uh, who knows what that's going to be um, as, as a, a, a full conglomerate of uh, objects touching objects. So here's that moment of the gateway. You, you pass under this, the material that's on the top becomes the material on the bottom, the material that's on the bottom becomes the material on the top, and they kind of twist through each other. But still at this moment, it's a very kind of raw and uh, brutal experience. And then you cross to the other side, and this completely other world opens up, this, this world now that's created by the cuts. And the ways in which these two buildings are cut also begin to create uh, a fusion of a kind of flat image, and then, whoop, a kind of object-like, don't move your mouse, object-like uh, element that's over at the edge where, there, where there's a cafe and other kinds of programs. Uh, how you circulate the building is you come under that thing, up these stairs, into the lobby, into this staircase that pulls you into the, the fused uh, bridge, which used to be a gate, now is a bridge, between the two buildings, so it's really one building constructed out of two buildings, which allows also the two separate theaters to function independently. Um, here you can kind of see the section where you come up those stairs, enter under this building, then come back around and go into this other uh, project, which is where the main theater space is, the main auditorium. So here's that space coming up those, those initial stairs with the spiral stays ab above you, where the exterior pitched roof shingling is clad, is wrapped inside, so that you come under this space, into this space, and then finally into the shingle as a volume. So the thing that used to be solid is now completely hollow and hovering above your head uh, abstractly as an inverted or a shingle roof turned inside out, pitched in all the ways that it's pitched. And then you come back into the entrance to the theater spaces and the theater is clad in a curtain. It's the only space of color in this space of circulation. And behind that is the object of the theater, all the circulation happening in this space of the poche. I said this word now. At least, what do, you, what do you say? Give me a guess. 94 times today. Yeah, maybe. Um, so the space of the poche, the object inside of the object, differentiating themselves and pulling themselves apart. Uh, until you finally get into the theater, and the theater is clad in this uh, kind of uh, fake marble screens on the back that becomes more and more closed as you go in approach to the space of performance and then flips entirely the other direction and opens up as you exit. You can see the lights, you can see the technology, and you can see much more of the materiality. So the, the process between materialization and dematerialization being the moment of entering the theater, seeing a performance, and then leaving the theater and having it revealed in a different manner. Um, but actually, the thing that we liked the best about this project was the model. Uh, and I know that that's, that's, that's a, that's a little, sounds like a little bit of a bummer, but no, we really liked the model. Because the model somehow got exactly to that uh, question of what is it that you are looking at. And yes, we got a lot of mileage out of that dichroic film, but uh, the, the movement around it constantly shifting your understanding of what you think is real and what you think is image, and then finally flattening itself out into a complete abstraction, yet it's only that abstraction that allows the building to function and the building to become an image to the rest of the city beyond, which makes it strangely contextual. I don't know if you thought that's where we're going to end up today. Like my last word is contextual. <laughs> yeah. But there it is. And sometimes you just try to find what's the weirdest thing you can say last. And if you can find a way to get there, uh, A to B will all just be uh, stuff in the mix. Um, so this is my last slide. And uh, thank you for staying and paying attention uh, tonight. It's great to be here. So I'm super happy to, to talk more if there's any questions or 
any anything you guys want to ask. That whole middle part of the, of the lecture that got cut out is a fragment of what the workshop saw today. Um, it's amazing. <laughs> Don't, it's, it's fine. But, yeah. Michael, can you tell us a little bit more about um, how you deal with materiality? Mm. So, it is not to suggest, but I think this one would be interesting because there is a, there would be a, some distance between um, material experience and also, the, not the least when you now also construct in Mexico, mm -hmm. and the um, various levels of abstraction that is removal from uh, the sort of real materiality in terms of old images and quantum representation. Yeah. And, and, and that's a, thank you, I think that's a, a it's an important thing to, to talk about because, um, I mean, this is basically a lecture on representation and that could be interpreted in one way in that I only care about the image and the drawing and the representation of the project. I hope, it, I hope at some level, what I really care about is when the representation and if we care to call it the tectonic or the construction of the building come into conflict. It's, it's that moment that I'm, I'm extremely interested in. And, uh, there have been some architectures that have produced this in, in the past. You know, the examples I sometimes use, and some of them are unexpected, is, is uh, Luigi Moretti. Uh, 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 actually, um, think that there there's something to do with this in Leverance, even though Leverance is is usually touted as the most material, phenomenologically poetic architect of all time. The dude's a weirdo, and and it's much what he's doing is much stranger than. Uh, just the, the expression of the brick. Uh, but it, all this is a, is a long-winded way to, to, to kind of set up um, when and in which ways does the, the raw experience of materiality come into conflict with the image of what you think you're looking at. At a certain level, the Harman Brinthauer paintings of the stones kind of do that. And so in a lot of these projects, uh, this one particularly, um, you know, the theater's clad in a fake curtain. The interior of the theater's clad in fake marble that's really just curtains of screens. So the curtains are marble. Uh, the marble are really curtains hung around the outside of the theater. The outside of the theater box that you enter into is really a photograph that was, this was inspired by Thomas Demand, uh, again over here uh, in, in your Stadel Museum. Th these things, by the way, it's always good to, to, to be clear about what you're referencing. But at the same time, that's real recycled slate. So that's slate that has been pulled from uh, decaying buildings that have been destroyed around Lithuania and brought to the site and, and uh, hung to not perform as slate would perform because slate performs best as a roof tile when it's outside. Just saying, um, but it is real slate. You know, it's not built. It, the proposal is that it's clad in real slate, meaning that this, the exterior wall here, is essentially this incredibly tight section of two slate walls, right back to back on top of each other. It's like you're outside, you see a slate roof. You go inside, and the entire thing is inverted into another slate volume. So that we wanted something that was like straight up common, everyday, used on every roof in Lithuania, a vernacular response, it, honestly contextualism, but contextualism put into a strange situation. And then also we were interested in something that, that looked incredibly heavy, but floating across a, a, a great expanse so that there was that kind of, we're not the first architects to think that was cool, it's been done by countless architects to float a heavy mass and go on. That's um, uh, a, a more typical move. But um, what are some other things we could say? Uh, the flipping of the material from above to below so that what was a roof becomes a base, what was a base becomes a roof. Uh, and, and these, we already talked a little bit about the, 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 the patination of the fake stone. Um, the, the, co the concrete 
in Mexico is incredibly raw and incredibly rough. And some of that's intentional. Um, in the vertical board forming, we've jacked in little glitches, meaning that we've taken little tiny shims, and every so often, uh, you punch them into the, the, the brick, uh, to the board formwork so that it bulges ever so slightly to try to get in our minds uh, the, the, the horizontal walls or the infill walls to become more and more rough so that the ruled surfaces can become more and more smooth and there'd be this contradistinction between the two even though they're monolithically poured. This is the structure, by the way. This is, these are structural walls, which was a kind of structural uh, chaos for the engineer because it means that the load is carrying down and carrying over and carrying down. It's moving through the walls eccentrically. Uh, there's, there's no columns on the interior. It's all being carried through load-bearing walls. Um, but as you can see, the ruled surfaces are just as rough as, as the walls themselves. So, you know, you, know, you got hopes and desires and then uh, it achieves something at the same time. The, the ruled surface creates uh, the equivalent of a knife edge along here. So at that moment, the heavy, thick, structural concrete wall becomes infinitely thin. And it also means that quite often they break. You, this, these aren't broken. I didn't show you any of the broken ones. The broken ones are really bad. You can kind of see this one right there, it's broken. Um, you can see this, look, there's errors all over the place. It's always good to point out the errors. Um, but anyways, just to us, that was, that was then a tension between the material uh, becoming so abstract and thin in a formal move, it's a formal idea to do that ruled surface, but the result would be the perception of uh, an incredibly thick, solid, almost bunker-like structure thinning itself out to the most delicate of knife edges revealed only at the, the moment of the frame of, of the window. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah. So then, would it be too much to say that one goal then is, is to uh, produce, you know, that one would be possible by somehow a contradiction or an assumed contradiction between effect and, and, and what is there? Yeah. And that is what you previously has referred to as estrangement. Yeah. Now, what would the difference be? Because it seems to me that some of these things, in terms of effect or experience, like they produce ambiguity. Mm -hmm. And ambiguity was the one of the key words that Roman Slutsky used when they described, described um, phenomenological transparency. Mm -hmm. Would there be a difference, you think, between the effect of ambiguity as addressed in by Rowan Slutsky and what you and others have spoken about in terms of distinction? Um. I won't speak for others, and I'm going to make something up right now. Yeah. All right. So, yes. So, Rowan Slutsky's uh, uh, difference between literal and phenomenal transparency and, and the ambiguity produced through multiple formal readings or, or a formal configuration which allows the possibility of multiple readings, which then uh, produces this kind of tension. Um, we could also say another ambiguity. So that, let's, let's call that uh, almost a formal conceptual ambiguity. Uh, then we could say that maybe there's the Venturi ambiguity where it's, it's all at the level of sign systems and there's an ambiguity between uh, the elusive and the elusive, uh, the, the relationship to a direct reference from a historical style given as an image and then the, the purposeful combination with popular images or with Las Vegas or with, with signage or with billboardings or advertising and, and flattening it and calling attention to it as, as, as a sign, a different kind of ambiguity. Um, and I'm wondering if the ambiguity that I'm looking for is, is less uh, an ambiguity of readings and, and more an ambiguity of, a, of attention of uh, attention. attention, that there's things that, that are very boring and things that are very uh, intense or attentive, 
and it's trying to get you to maybe not guide your attention, but get you to question what it is that you're looking at and then pay more attention to it. Because I, I, I think that could maybe be, and again, I'm making this up as I speak, that could maybe be something about this tension between the image and the reality or reality and its representation that's less uh, structured around the knowledge of, of certain symbolic sign systems and Venturi <coughs> and less structured on uh, the necessity of, of multiple possible formal readings, which is the Rosleski Eisenman trajectory, and more, more somehow in, the, in, in this, maybe it's a tension between uh, representation and phenomenology, maybe it's a tension between uh, experience and multiple forms. Uh, to me, the virtual reality actually kind of, that we just saw gets at it. It's, it's not not experience, it is experience. It is not not reality. You know, we can't say that somehow there's there's more value to the experience of me not wearing the VR and then the experience of me wearing the VR. They're both equally real. Uh, you can say maybe one uses uh, electricity and I could pull the plug and then we could ask what's really really real. But um, that's just momentary. When you're in that virtual reality experience, it's you believe it to be so. We find fine balance of fine though, because someone suggested to me recently that, you know, um, in terms of experience, it would be very easy to fall back into a sort of conventional phenomenology. Yeah. Um, yeah. A sort of existential wall <laughs> in terms of these things. I think that... So when you refer to that, I uh, wouldn't want the words in your mouth, but I would imagine that you, that you wouldn't want. That I would not want at all. Um, but I think it's something that's come up uh, more and more so through through a lot of the discussions in recent years that involve uh, things like object-oriented ontology and Graham Harmon, because for them they consider that to be phenomenological philosophy. And you say phenomenology to us as architects, and I, and and you, you may have many different responses to this. Uh, there's still I I know many architects who phenomenology is a good word. It's human, it's embodied, it's, it's sensual, it's the experiential, and it ties us to our uh, fundamental relationship to the planet before we got into this mediated mess. Yeah. Um, for me, phenomenology has a lot of problems as it's been interpreted by architects. And, and if you wanted me to, to just quickly state the three, I have a problem with um, dismissing mediation outright. Everything we do has always been mediated. Always, in, every mediation involves technology, from uh, the pencil to the to the computer, from language to to today. And so, to imagine that there's some sort of world in which we can remove all these veils of mediation is is, is to me false. Uh, the other would be the ways in which um, architects can have made claims to. Uh, materiality, having very, very specific special magical powers, as if it, this you, architect can teach you the stoniness of the stone or the woodiness of the wood, and, and they know it and you don't, and here it is, the stony stone, the woody wood, and, and that's going to make your world better, and, and I don't believe that. Uh, and then the last thing is the, the sort of genus loci arguments, that somehow we would be able to know the spirit of a place, access the spirit of the place, and then design something that gave you the spirit of the place. And I don't even know what the spirit of the place means. Um, so those three things I would steer away from constantly. But we are still talking about um, uh, experience in multiple levels, which does mean we are talking about phenomena, which does mean we are talking about relationships between sound and vision and, and all of that. And. Uh, uh, that does have aspects of phenomenology to it that we're going to have to find a new way to talk about and, and, and not just say phenomenology good, phenomenology bad, because it's, it's, it's a little bit like um, certain words come in and out of fashion and we can say, we can just use them as, as signifiers for what you're for or what you're against without actually unpacking all the ne necessary baggage that they, they, they bring with them. And I think phenomenology is kind of one of, those, one of those words where I use it to say everything I'm against, but actually I know that I'm using parts of it. And if I don't get sharper about this, then what the hell am I doing? Uh, just wanna, can you 
you shed some light on some of the formal or volumetric kind of operations that you're doing in some of these projects? Because I mean, I might be a little late here, but uh, one of the cone, the Berlin projects, where it's for the cones, is looks like a Velasquez diagram of the block on mm -hmm. the melodies, but this time the melodies are skewed in or opened up, and then mm -hmm. there's something going on. So is there that are there those kind of conversations that you are looking uh, for? Um, I got my start teaching with Peter Eisenman. Uh, I, I taught for years descriptive projective geometry courses. And Kutan uh, and I met working for Jesse Reiser and Nanako Momoto. Um, they're both our professors in school. Uh, we're, we're, we like form. Right? We do. And we like geometry. Um, I think that we just got to a point where the ways in which formalisms were being discussed were not sufficient to the arguments we needed to make. So I'm, I'm not suppressing any of that. I mean, I think for all of, all of you, I hope it's very clear how invested I am in, in the importance of formal decisions. Uh, I just didn't feel anymore, this, this happened years ago now, that I, could, that I actually thought that the value of what I was doing was in the geometry of, of the forms I was making. I felt that actually the impact that they had within aesthetics was a much more important conversation and that I was very bad at talking about aesthetics and I needed to get better. And, and so there could be another parallel uh, virtual reality world uh, lecture in which I show everything, but I only talk about um, how it is to, to produce the world's surfaces. There would also be another lecture that talks about how we built these things, because it was a really weird process. You can imagine the board formings for, for the, the heads, uh, uh, leaving the traces of their marks, but how do you get board forms for the sill? Hmm? Right? Do I have this one? These. How do you get those? These. Because you're not casting up. We still got this gravity problem. Yeah. So all of the molds were built identical and then we cast fiberglass molds from them that had the board form scoring in it. And so that would also ensure that the head and the sill were identical. And then we, we so all of these are cast into fiberglass molds. Uh, only so that we can get the imprinting of the aesthetic of boards on the, on the sill. It's silly, it really is. But um, it, it produces the aesthetic effect of the window pulling itself, rotating in, and then the slabs being sucked into the middle of the building. And so that involves form, that involves geometry, and that involves uh, tectonics and constructions. But all of it's geared towards an, an engagement at some level of an, of an aesthetic estrangement. So, and I don't know if that, I know that doesn't totally answer all of your question, um, but uh, yeah, that's what we did. <coughs> Time for beer? Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Guys.